My name is Roger Bingham, and this is the um, opening of what I hope will be a series of Science in Society events from the Collaboratory, which is a center within the Institute for Neural Computation here at UCSD. This is the opening event of um, Science in Society. So uh, what I would like to do is to just introduce, um, uh, ask Pat to start off, and then pass on to Reed Montague, who again is part of this 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 group that we're talking about, because Terry's lab, the Computational Neurobiology Lab at the Salk Institute, um, has spawned a great number of, of, of tremendous thinkers. Um, Reed Montague was here in 1991-1903. Peter Diane at roughly the same time. Um, so we have um, these these. This, this group of people who witnessed this whole thing transitioning. And I think it's just going to be tremendous um, uh, to find out where, where, where you think this is all going. So let me just, um, let me just uh, introduce Pat very quickly. This is the book. It's called Conscience, The Origins of Moral Intuition. Um, she's um, a unique figure, in my view, in the sense that uh, very early on, quite, she wrote a book called Neurophilosophy. Um, and uh, that created essentially a new discipline. Um, her understanding of, of, of all, all of these issues have turned up in books like Touching a Nerve and so on. Um, I don't want to talk too much about this. You can easily look her up and so on. But let me just introduce Pat, and, and um, we'll take it from there. Thanks. So it has long been an interesting question to me where moral motivation comes from at all. and. Uh, I was fascinated. I mean, I really never expected that neuroscience would ever shed any light on it. I thought it was just going to be, you know, uh, way too mysterious and we'll never get there. But uh, in, in actual fact, we do know a little bit. And it's a little bit that will guide us in our next step. So in 1871, Darwin wrote The Descent of Man. And in The Descent of Man, amongst many other wonderful things, he raises the question, so where does our moral sense or our conscience come from? And he proposes an answer. He says, there are really three features. There is instinct. We, and, it, and secondly, that's not the music, I take it, no. <laughs> and secondly, he says, there are skills and habits. And third, there is reasoning, or what we might call problem solving. And it seemed to me to be a really striking thing, especially because, as a philosopher, I knew what Aristotle had said about 350 before the Christian era, uh, 350 years before the Christian era. Aristotle said much the same thing. We are social by nature, by which he meant we have an, in, uh, an instinct to be social. We like to be together. We solve problems together. We feel disappointment when we are rejected. We like, to be, we like approval. We dislike disapproval. We are social by nature. Like Darwin, he saw that the second really important thing had to do not with how we are by nature, but how we learn things. And that we are powerfully disposed to form habits and skills, not just to navigate our physical world, where we learn about hammers and saws and so forth, but to navigate our social world. And that, perhaps unbeknownst to our conscious selves, we internalize the ways of our community, what things people approve of, what they disapprove of, what is expected of us, and what we can expect from others. And finally, like Darwin, he said, the third thing is that social life is beset with many practical problems. He was very different from Plato, who thought they were all sort of deep, well, up in Plato's heaven, ideological problems. And Aristotle, of course, was very much a man of the world. His father was a physician. He had uh, understood quite a lot about how to uh, 
deal with the physical world. He was very practical. And he thought problem solving in the social domain is fundamentally a practical issue about how we are going to get on in our social life. And what I think is new and somewhat surprising in a way is that we now understand a little bit about each of those three things. We understand a little bit about what it means to be social by nature. We understand a little bit about how the reward system works such that we internalize norms, sometimes without our even being aware that it's a norm <laughs> that we're internalizing. Where I think we know the least has to do with reasoning and problem solving. That is, uh, neurobiologically, uh, we know the least. I should say, too, that um, in addressing these kinds of questions about where our moral sense or our moral intuitions come from, that there are many sciences, sciences that have played a really important role, certainly anthropology, because one of the grand myths of many cultures uh, is that humans and only humans have moral motivation. We now know that's clearly not true. And in, in some of the discussion, I will uh, regale you with some of my favorite experiments and my favorite data showing that chimpanzees, but even rodents, and certainly marmosets, and lots and lots of mammals have moral motivation, by which I mean they will incur, an individual will incur a cost to himself in order to help another without benefit to you yourself. And so anthropology has been tremendously important. Um, genetics has been important, neuroscience, psychology. Uh, and in general, the people who have looked at stones and bones to help us understand what the earliest hominins could do, and also how hunter-gatherer societies live and whether or not their moral norms are governed by or have their origin in the idea of a divine lawgiver. And although we can go into this more in the question or discussion period, it's very clear that until about 10,000 years ago, with the advent of agriculture, hunter-gatherer groups survived and did well when they did uh, without benefit of the idea of a divine lawgiver. They might have had ideas of spirits of this and spirits of that and so forth, so-called folk religions. But their moral behavior, and we know this from living groups of uh, hunter-gatherers, such as the Inuit, their moral behavior was governed by traditions, by discussion, by songs, and ways of solving disputes, ways of settling conflicts, uh, with no idea whatever that the divine lawgiver gave them insight into how best to proceed. So one question then is, all right, if we know a little bit about all this, what's the evolutionary background? I mean, after all, of course, there are social insects. And there are social fish. And even some reptiles seem to like to hang out together. And we want to first of all make the obvious point that in mammalian social behavior, we see a whole new level of complexity, a whole new level of flexibility. That is, to put it sort of crudely, if you think of insects as largely under the control of, of their genes, that is, their behavior is strongly genetically controlled, that is less true in the case of mammals, and less true the bigger the brain. So all right, so mammals have this big brain, and they have a kind of capacity for seeing into the future to see what you might feel if I do this. And 
uh, and planning accordingly for feeling awkward or bad if I contemplate something that I think will be uh, socially unacceptable. So where did all that come from? I mean, what's the evolutionary story? Now, evolutionary biologists have grappled with this for a long time. And mostly, they have thought, well, whatever the answer is, it has to be that all behavior ultimately has to serve my inclusive fitness. And in a certain sense, that's like saying, ultimately, it all has to be selfish. But that doesn't actually seem to be what the data from the anthropologists who study animals who aren't humans uh, show. So we have to look at the evolution of mammalian behavior in a slightly different way. So the story seems to go something like this. About 200 million years ago, something appeared on the planet that was really unusual and had and almost certainly never appeared before, and that was endotherms, creatures that are able to generate their own heat, warm-blooded animals. And they had a tremendous advantage because they could forage at night when nobody else was around. All the cold-blooded cousins were asleep. And they could forage or go to colder climates, and their bodies would keep them warm. And it was a tremendous advantage. However, as in many evolutionary developments in morphology, it came with a huge cost. And the cost is very interesting. The cost was that gram for gram, a warm-blooded animal has to eat 10 times as much as its cold-blooded cousin. And that puts a huge ecological constraint on the warm-blooded creature. So what happened? Now, if I may speak anthropomorphically, uh, Mother Nature basically said to herself, well, God, these guys have to eat so much. What's the best strategy uh, for giving them an advantage in survival? And roughly the answer was big learning. For reasons that we don't really understand, cortex came into being. All mammals have cortex. Even the lowly shrew and the lowly mouse have a cortex. Uh, they come in varying sizes, but all mammals and only mammals have a cortex. OK, quick aside, that's not entirely true. <laughs> it turns out that birds, and Harvey Carton here at UCSD was one of the first people to realize this, Birds actually have something that is analogous in its wiring to cortex. It just doesn't look like this beautiful six-layered, highly structured thing. But I'm, I'll just, for reasons of time, I'm just going to talk about, um, about uh, mammals. So that was a great thing. You have, have big learning. Um, but the problem. The, the solution to uh, foraging, if you're a warm-blooded animal, namely cortex, also comes with a cost. So what's the cost this time? This time, the cost is as follows. We know that when you learn something, there has to be gene expression that makes a protein. And the protein has to be incorporated into structure. And structure has to grow. There have to be sprouts on the dendrites. There have to be new synapses. There has to be axonal branching. You have to have stuff. If you're going to have big learning, that is, if the brain is going to tune itself up to this environment that it's in, it has to have lots of room to grow. Well, so, OK, that sounds good. But that means that the baby has to be very immature when it's born, so the brain can tune itself up to whatever environment it happens to be in. If you're going to be a big learner, you've got to be a stupid baby. So Mother Nature says, well, you know, that kind of backfired. So uh, what's the strategy now? Because you've got this vulnerable baby that is easy pickings for any of the cold-blooded creatures who happen to be around. And the answer was, well, take that fundamental wiring that everything has.
to take care of itself, to see to its own warmth and food and safety, and expand that to the baby. And since the, the mother is giving live birth, she's the one that's around, change her wiring, and make her attached to that offspring. In other words, expand the sense of self from me to me and mine, so that I will take care of my offspring in much the way that I take care of myself. So what, just as I feel pain if I'm threatened by a predator, so I feel pain when my baby rat falls out of the nest. And then I get the rat, and I put it the baby, and I put it back in the nest, and I feel good. So basically, it's not that there was a whole new system for social emotions. It's rather that the old system for seeing to our own needs got expanded, and attachment to others became a style that we see in all mammals. And a simple way, I think, of thinking this about this is that if you are attached to your baby, then you care for that baby. And you protect it, even when circumstances are very dire. And that is a kind of morality. So it's like attachment begets care, and care begets morality. And once that's sort of in place, then, of course, there can be adjustments to the genes so that you can become attached not only to offspring, but to kin, to friends, and to mates. And here, of course, the story turns to what we learned in a very surprising way about mate attachment. Am I sort of, where is Roger the timekeeper? Uh, OK, I better sort of try to wrap it up quickly. Anyway, what we know about mate attachment, uh, we learned initially from the prairie voles. So um, you, many of you will know this story, but it's my favorite story, so I'll tell it anyway. Uh, so there's many kinds of voles. There's montane voles, and they're kind of like what everybody thinks rodents are like. And that is the male and the female meet, they mate, and then they go their separate ways. So she's going to have the babies, and he's looking for more action. Prairie voles are quite different, by and large. So what happens in this case is the male and the female meet, they mate, and now they are bonded for life. And what does that mean? It means that most of their sexual action takes place between the two of them, that the male helps rear the pups, he guards the nest against others. And if they are separated, they get very depressed. They want to be together. They like to hang out together. And I can give you exactly what that means experimentally, if, if, if you like. Um, and, um, and moreover, there's another aspect to this. And that is that prairie voles tend to live in the large community so that the siblings also help rear the pups. So it's much more social, shall we say, uh, than what we see in the case of montane voles. When this behavior was initially discovered, a number of neuroendocrinologists sort of scratched their head and thought, what's the difference in the brain between the prairie voles and the montane voles? And after a few sort of false starts, the basic answer came, and it's that in a very specific part of the reward system, namely the nucleus accumbens, there is a much higher density of receptors for oxytocin and in the prairie voles as contrasted to the montane voles. And the sibling um, peptide, vasopressin, also has, in the prairie voles, but not the Mount montane voles, a high density of receptors for vasopressin in another part of the reward system, the ventral pallidum. Now that, so far, of course, was only a correlation. But eventually, the various manipulations were done. And it's very clear, I think, at this point, that oxytocin 
and vasopressin are really important regulators of sociality in mammals. And it also looks like the analog of oxytocin is a regulator of sociality in birds. So in mammals, only about 5 to 6 percent are long-term pair bonders, although many of them are social in other ways. Um, in birds, about 95 percent are long-term pair bonders. And you can instantly see what the, <laughs> what the evolutionary explanation is for that. So that gives you um, an, an insight into the instinct part of the story, the innate disposition to be social. What about the learning part? And here, it turned out, this, this kind of amazing thing happened, that Reed Montague and Peter Diane were postdocs in Terry's lab. And they came across a discovery, a neurobiological discovery, about the brainstem. And they realized what it meant. And the authors themselves did not actually realize how to interpret uh, their own results. And this was the beginning of something truly amazing, which has to do with understanding the reward system as not just a sort of, you know, two-bit Pavlovian thing, but as something that is capable of doing very rich, very complicated learning, including learning of norms. And so over to you, Reed. So you've, you've got some slides, haven't you? I have two. Because one of the slides has got a, a, an image, the third slide, the can third one. Can plug this in? It's got an image on it which relates to what you've been talking to, but in terms of, of political beliefs and so on. And you said that there was a fairly major um, conceptual shift to you reading that paper, yeah. the, the recent paper of Reeves. The, the... Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's a picture of John Hibbing with worms. Oh, in yeah, his yeah, mouth. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I would like to get on to that. Let me just, just remind you of one thing. I, um, uh, when I was doing a little stand-up recently, or, or an attempt to do this, the Ascent of Minds thing, I did a little piece to camera. Uh, and this will just show you how crazy some of this stuff is. I did a little piece to camera when I was at the Salk Institute. And I said to the camera as I was walking along in front of the Salk Institute, if you wanted to get somebody to come and join you here, me, at the Salk Institute, it's very simple because they can use this, even if they don't know where the Salk Institute is. They've got a global positioning system. They've got a GPS, and it's just trivial. Um, what happened? What would happen? How would you construct an, what I called an MPS, which is a moral positioning system, which is constantly telling you whether you're doing something that's right or wrong? I know that's a crazy idea, but this, there's some, <laughs> something, some, is there an algorithm for conscience? How is this all working? I mean, how is it so? Maybe you can add some, add some comments well, to this. I don't know what I can do about that. Tell us what, the, what the, <laughs> the, 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 the neurochemical underpinnings are of this can we, problem. Can we plug game. this picture in, this uh, computer in? I can't, but Lara probably can. Lara here? Because uh, she's technically sophisticated and I'm not. I have anything you want micro USB. Oh, back to the music. Okay. Okay, I'll, I'll make this short. I can't really improve. That was uh, captivating, Pat. Um, I'm going to start by saying one personal thing, which is when I come, I haven't been here in a long, long time. I was here um, 30 years ago, something like that. Okay. Uh, so I was a postdoc here in a group with, that included uh, Francis Crick and Terry and Chuck Stevens and Pat um, uh, as a daily, uh, it was a daily bread at 4 p.m. And it was a combative, roiling uh, collision of all kinds of people, psychologists and physicists and mathematicians and whatnot. And basically, we were inventing our version of computational neuroscience. I've evolved since then, I think, and expanded to a lot more experiment. but. Um, Terry saved me. I won't go into how he saved me, but he, 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 um, he basically called me up and said, hey, you want a job? And I was working on a ward. I was an MD-PhD student. I was, a, I was literally on a medical ward. 
and I, I think I quit the next day, and I came out here, and the way Terry recruits you is not to have a moral positioning system. He just comes and gets you at the hotel. He drives you to the back parking lot of the sock, and he says, get out of the car and look at the Pacific. <laughs> that was it. So, thanks for that. Um, um, but we've, uh, the, the, the work we did here uh, dovetails very well with, I mean, it was in many ways the learning part of what Pat um, is appealing to from various kinds of angles. And um, I know this, is, this isn't a technical talk in any sense, but I'm going to show you two pictures, and then I'll switch to John Hibbing eating um, nightcrawler worms and make the point. So what is common across bees, rodents, people, computer programs that play Atari Go, et cetera? And the answer is the algorithms that learn to predict rewards and learn to choose actions predicated on those predictions. Okay? Now, that's a, a very modern finding. That is, um, here's AlphaGo Lee, which beat Lee at all, the, the Korean Go champion. Um, Go is a tremendously complex game in terms of the size of its state space. At any point in the game, it has an average branch factor of 250. That means at any point during the play of a game, you have 250 possible choices next. Chess is in the sort of 30 to 40 range. I don't actually know exactly what chess is. It's about 34. Um, so people aren't even sure exactly how big the state space is. But basically, using reinforcement learning systems that are not really any different than what is in a bee's brain when it's in a kid's brain, or a, this is a, a songbird's brain, or a rodent's brain, um, they've learned to play Go and wiped out really the history of the subject. You can't play Go anymore. Uh, uh, that particular game was tuned with grandmaster input, and they realized that that distracted its discovery of the best kinds of solutions, because at the heart of all this is something called evaluation function. These are systems in your brain Systems in the brains of things that learn how to play adaptive games, that learn to value the world around them, that learn to value the next thing that they could do, and choose things predicated on that value. Okay? These are forward-looking systems, meaning they don't look at the past. They look to predict the future, and they learn to predict some function of the long-term future. And that's what they're concerned with. They're causal. Um, I know there's some cognitive scientists here, so there's a whole, there's a whole area of co cognitive science and, and graphical theory where people learn um, that one thing causes another thing. This is uh, the work, this is flowed out of the work originally of Sewell Wright and then Judah Pearl on what's called the do calculus, and that, that is that people and organisms on this planet, for whatever reason, um, learn that one thing causes another. There's a directionality to it. So these systems won't learn things backwards. They look for things that predict things that are good outcomes and whatnot. They're predictive systems. Let me just show you one more picture. Okay, here they are again. So the algorithms are common across them, and then there are also common anatomical motifs in the brain. So this is a, a cut through the picture of the honeybee brain here. This is a single neuron. This neuron contains a chemical called octopamine, which it delivers out to these branches here. These are actually the dendrites of this neuron. This neuron is absolutely essential for this bee to be able to learn to associate um, an odor from a flower with the nectar that the flower delivers. Okay? The odor predicts the nectar. This neuron mediates that. You can literally go into the, uh, a bee head, put an electrode in this neuron here, present a novel odorant, fire the neuron, and the bee will learn to condition on that odor. You can even go one step further. You can bypass the neuron altogether, go out here to the terminals, and deliver the octopamine that the electrical impulses in the cell body would have delivered had it been activated, and pair a novel odorant with the delivery of octopamine, and the system still learns. Okay? So it seems to be a very big principle in systems that have to learn. Now, this is not, a, this is not an animal that has a cortex. Um, that the predictive part of it is really crucial. And also the idea that you have a small number of neurons that predict to wide territories of neural tissue. Same thing is true. These are, these are axons from single dopamine neurons in the brainstem of a rat. The color coding here has to do with where they're ending up in the neural tissue here. This is basically one axon um, branching in a region of the brain, rat's brain called the striatum. This is a more schematized version on human here. 
showing uh, where these neurons originate in an area called the ventral tegmental area in the uh, Santa Nigra. That's where the cell bodies are. Depending on who's counting, there is somewhere between 50 and 80,000 of these neurons per side, um, bilaterally symmetric in a human being. Uh, in a rodent, it's about 1,500 to 2,000. These make the chemical called dopamine. That dopamine, and these, they make electrical impulses. They go run out into these terminals. And the idea is that wherever they run, they're causing the release of dopamine. Okay. If anybody drank coffee there tonight, it's a methylated xanthine. It blocks dopamine reuptake. It potentiates the impact of dopamine on downstream structures. It gives you that attentive feeling. It gives you the motivation to learn. It gets you get up and going. Okay. You're talking to your dopamine system when you drink coffee and tea and whatever. Um, it's absolutely crucial for the way you value the world. If you remove these neurons, life is not worth living. You literally sit frozen in a chair. You have an inability to initiate volitional actions, and you have a whole f slew of cognitive features which are actually kind of poorly characterized, one of which is your actions seem to be ranked as having flat consequences. This thing is, um, you, if you know anybody with Parkinson's disease, um, you'll know what I'm talking about. You recognize some of those symptoms. The symptoms are a lot more subtle than that when you start digging in, but that's, that's the basic um, fact. When you uh, show up in front of a neurologist, you've already lost, with symptoms, you've already lost 70 to 80 percent of those neurons. We don't know why that happens, but we do know a lot about now um, uh, when they fire, why they fire, and how they do associative learning of the kind that Pat uh, really requires of the kind of moral, the kind of learning and tuning you have to do to be, to have attachment and to have reciprocating interactions with other uh, creatures like yourself. And here's a bird brain. It also has a ventral tegmental area that has dopaminergic neurons that projects up to an area that's crucially involved in song learning. Bird sits and listens to a male singing to it for about, about a year. It uses that, lays down a template, and uses that template to teach itself using the dopamine input. So this is a motif. This is an algorithmic motif that exists between, um, across species, from bees all the way up to human beings. And it has uh, structural commonalities across them, as you can see here. So something's really important for evolved organisms in this world to learn to predict things into the future, to do valuation that's both um, long range and flexible. Okay? The things that you learn now may be good for now, but they may not be good next week when all of a sudden the creek bread dries up and you have to go relearn what's valuable again. So they're not only systems that have to look far into the future, they have to look far into a flexible future. They have to maintain a kind of flexibility. And it's these systems that um, Peter, Diane, and Terry and I worked on you know, 30 years ago when we were here. I, across the last 20 years, have segued into taking um, this algorithmic perspective and moving into different, I, I think, expansive domains. What happens when you start thinking about uh, um, concrete things like choosing Coca-Cola over Pepsi-Cola? When you start uh, interacting with another person who may give you feedback, and it's positive feedback versus negative feedback, the kind of reciprocal interactions you have with anybody that's near you. What happens when you expand um, and ask these systems to operate in small groups where somebody in the group gives you feedback, you get feedback about how you're doing with respect to the group. What happens when you put a system like this in a, in a setting where you're playing a little gambling game with a computer and, the, and you get, you're like Wimpy and Popeye. Everybody heard of Wimpy and Popeye? I gladly pay you Tuesday for a hamburger today. Okay. So you say, loan me $10 today. And you keep saying, loan me $10 today and $10 today. And then one day the guy goes, um, you know, I'm not, I'm going to give you $10 anymore. And you're profoundly disappointed, even though they didn't owe you $10. You've readjusted your expectations of them, right? So we've taken, we can show how systems like this are profoundly looking for, to establish a norm, as it were, with both the world or another person. What is this likely to give me? Okay, and this is now zero. I'm going to re-zero to this, and anything above that I'm going to be excited by. Anything below that I'm going to be disappointed by. Okay. I'm just going to do two, two more pictures. These are the same systems that are hijacked by every drug of abuse that you could name. They cause the cells to fire. They cause dopamine release, like in the case of caffeine. Caffeine will cause dopamine release to be potentiated. So will methylphenidate, methamphetamine, uh, cocaine, 
um, uh, heroin has an impact at the, at the level of the, the cells themselves, hijacks this system. But it makes a point. So I'm going to, this is a thought experiment, okay? So if, suppose I snuck into your room. Okay, this is a, okay, this is a weird thought experiment, okay? <laughs> You have to bear with me here, okay? Okay, let's imagine I'm going to sneak into your room on random time boundaries. You're not going to know it, and I'm going to inject you with heroin, okay? There's no trace of the injection, and I'm doing it on random time boundaries so you, so, so you don't get used to, you know, it's not right when you go to sleep every night, and all, you, otherwise you, your, your body would start to pick up on that. Okay, I'm going to do this for three months. Okay, now we're going to vote. At the end of three months... How many people think you're addicted to heroin? Anybody? Okay, how many people think you're not addicted to heroin? Oh, about 50-50. Okay. You are not addicted to heroin. Okay? You are not addicted to heroin. The idea of heroin, cues associated with heroin, the sound of the word, anything that reminds you of it, does not cause you to reorganize your behavior, to go do maladaptive things, to go seek heroin. Now, you're sick. You're showing up in front of the doctor. You're throwing up. You have diarrhea. Your body is physiologically dependent on heroin, but we have not paired it with either an internal state or an external cue that systematically predicts the heroin delivery here. You're not addicted to heroin. The point is it's, lear it's a learning process that gets hijacked. It's not just, oh, you want heroin. You don't know to want heroin. You don't know what's wrong with you. For all you know, you know you've, you've, you've eaten a... A bad eel in that weird restaurant where you pick the eels out and they boil them. Okay, so I'll make one other point. I, I, I'm not actually making a point. I'd just like to show John. This is a colleague of mine called John Hibbing from the University of Nebraska, Lincoln. Um, he's um, <laughs> uh, so there is a there's a set of emotionally evocative pictures that people that do cognitive science have access to its uh, database kept by the University of Florida called the International Effective Picture, IAPS, International Effective Picture System. You have to sign up to it and whatnot. And one of the things you sign up and promise to do is you promise not to, ex to give it away, to pollute the, the possible subject pools you know, worldwide. Oh, that's the picture from the IAPS. Um, so this is one of the pictures that would be considered disgusting um, because John Hibbing, who's a political scientist, um, did the following simple experiment with us. So he, he, had, he found me. Uh, he and a guy called John Alford at Rice University uh, were very interested in the, or, the biological origins of political ideology. They had been working in a twin registry in Australia looking at the degree to which um, political ideology, as assayed by a kind of common political ideology survey called the Wilson-Patterson Ideological Survey, was potentially heritable, like height, okay? The idea would be go to a twin registry and give them all the monozygotic twins and dizygotic twins raised apart and together, the full two by two. You're a twin, you came from the same egg, you have the same DNA, you're either raised together or you're raised apart. You're a fraternal twin, you grow up in the same womb, you're either raised together or you're raised apart, okay? Um, I won't go through the details of that, um, the numbers were stunningly big. Um, I think they get 0.48 for heritability. Height is something like 0.52 or something. It's like a half. Okay. That's not to say that um, you're inheriting who you vote for from your parents. I didn't believe it. Okay. I, mean, I didn't believe it. For me, it was like, that's ridiculous. Um, political ideology is like an accent. The reason I sound like somebody from Georgia is because I grew up in Georgia. And the reason I don't sound like somebody from England is I didn't grow up in England. You inherit this from, you, from your environs. Um, that's not right. That's not right. There's a big genetic component for the big features of your social sensibilities that sort of play into what you'd call political ideology. Anyway, you can take and show that what they had was a result where they thought that your reactivity to uh, emotionally disgusting and evocative stimuli should co-vary with uh, your political ideology. I, I'll let Pat weigh in on this. She's written about it better than I have. So we did an experiment where we showed people a bunch of international effective picture system pictures in a scanner and just recorded their brain activity. Okay? 
And they get out of the scanner and they give, we give them the Wilson-Patterson political ideology assay. And then we use machine learning algorithms to try to develop a mapping from can we see responses in the brain that predict their score on the test, okay? And the answer, the, the idea, one of the ideas behind this is, is a set of ideas, I think, um, promulgated by or supported by uh, Jonathan Haidt, where the idea, what, where two of the things that you had to get right a long time ago is dealing with contamination and dealing with physical threat, okay? If you don't deal with contamination right, if you're not scared of contamination, if you organize your culture so that the bakery and the abattoir is right next to the latrine, that's a really bad idea, okay? So there's a cultural constraint. Don't build the latrine right next to where you prepare food, okay? Um, whether or not that's true, I don't know. But the fact is you can develop a mapping from the response to these pictures to how you respond on this test that's, um, that's so good it's ridiculous, really. You can just predict how people are going to score on the test, and you can predict how they're going to vote. And um, it's certainly not going to end up being that um, simple-minded. But these pictures we know are activating um, the same sort of reward systems that are used to sort of run toward good stuff and run away from bad stuff. And so that's why I put that up there. And so that's my little synopsis for me. Thanks. So what you actually said in that letter to me when you were first talked about it, your description of this in one line was computational and neurotransmitter underpinnings of social decision-making and feelings, digging deeper into neurobiology for the substrates of conscience. Yeah, use the mic. This is not working. This was it's working. Is this on? Well, I'll use this one now. Um, Computational neurotransmitter underpinnings of social decision-making and feelings, digging need deeper into neurobiology for the substrates of conscience. Do, do you want to add something to what he was, to what Rita was just saying then? And I'd like to talk to some of the audience and find out whether they're actually identifying with this description at this kind of level. Yeah, I mean, I think... Um, do you have your own... Yeah, I do. I mean, I, like Rita, I, I initially thought that the suggestion that uh, ideological attitudes might have a heritable component was outrageous. It just seemed to me most likely that it, it was all learned. But I think what really kind of turned me around was thinking that although we don't really understand this this range of areas that are more active in someone who is, shall we say, a traditionalist and much less active in someone who is a non-traditionalist. We don't have a name for all of these areas. They're not the, you know, whatever. Uh, it's a kind of weird collection. And so it made me think that temperament is really what we're talking about here. It, and, and temperament isn't something that is well-defined. Uh, it's not something for which we have very much in the way of, uh, of neuroscience. But that our temperament, just as we understand that in a common sense way, probably does have a lot to do with sort of shaping our social style, shall we say, so that it makes, for some people who have a certain kind of social temperament, they will be more, it, find some norms harder to learn and harder to accept than certain other people. Or they may find it easier to change their mind about certain norms than other people. And, and then, of course, there's everything else um, in between. And, and so it's not that I really think that, that the correct description of what you guys found is that ideological attitudes are highly heritable. That is about 0.48 heritable. Um, it's that something that we don't have a name for is heritable, and that shows up in a variety of different ways. And one of the ways it might show up 
at this particular time in history is ideological attitudes. But for short, why not call it ideological attitudes right now? I just thought it was a stunning result. And I'm still surprised by the result. Because I you know, look into my soul, and I think my attitudes are as they are, because I really thought about them hard and long. <laughs> and I read things that had an influence on me. I mean, how can it be that my political attitudes are as they are, at least in significant measure, for the same reason that I'm tall? When you use the phrase uh, moral platform, yeah. yeah, what do you can you do a very simple, quick version of that? Well, when I talk about the moral platform, it's it's kind of instead of talking about instinct and innate structure, yeah. but it is the basic um, circuitry that makes it possible for attachment between parents and offspring, and that means that even very early on, babies show empathy for uh, individuals who are hurting, whether it's even just a puppet uh, or a toy. If one puppet is you know, beating the crap out of the other puppet, they feel sorry for the one that's getting beaten up. And so even very young children have this sense of empathy uh, towards others. Now, there's, that's not 100% of kids, of course, but, uh, but, but normally that's true. I mean, we do know that there are psychopaths where the wiring is different. Um, and it's not that they are cognitively impaired. It's that they are socially, they just do not feel embarrassment or shame or remorse. They can lie with the greatest of them. Yes, the greatest of them. Uh, and they're very narcissistic. Um, yeah. So that's sort of what I mean by platform. And we know a certain amount about the nature of the circuitry that has to be in place in order for you to acquire norms in the way that Reed was talking about, and in order for you to feel affection and attachment uh, to others. Yeah, did, when you were coming in, did, did you know you were given cards? Did you actually have any of you filled out any well, questions? <clears throat> they haven't been passed out if yet. You, if you have a question, By the way, uh, as we're going along with while these images are still <laughs> playing, um, some of the images were put together um, um, by, by um, a scientist called. Um, Beata, who has a, a Beata Science Art uh, website. She's actually over at the back um, there. Um, thank you, Beata. And the, the collaboratory imagery and so on was done by Marley Rosser, who's standing next to her. So thank you both for what you've done there. Um, the, the, the use of the word conscience again in these things that we've put up here, does, does it jibe at all with what you're thinking? I mean, well. I mean, all right, so we have, a scene, uh, we have a scene, Hamlet, OK? Um, oh, I don't know. Um, and and, and the, he has the players come in, and he decides to put on a play because he thinks his uncle killed his father and so on. The play is the thing wherein I'll find the conscience of the king because he expects people's faces to reveal and their behavior, uh, the, 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 king's, the, the current king's face and behavior to reveal his conscience, the pangs of conscience that you've mentioned in pieces before. Um, I, it's interesting. That's the to, everyday yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's interesting to me, of course, that that not all cultures have a word that is the, uh, the equivalent of our word conscience. Um, <laughs> and and most importantly, the ancient Greeks did not have. And while we think about Socrates always talking about his conscience, because he would talk about his little voice that would tell him, no, you really ought not to do that, or yes, you really must do this. Uh, ancient Greek did not have a word for conscience. It really came out later of Roman culture. And it was, I think, early on, it was used in a courtroom um, context where Cicero wanted to make the point that his client 
understood the community standards. And in Latin, that meant he had conscientia. He right. had knowledge of community standards. Uh, and of course, the word has evolved in its meaning um, since, since then. But, but lots of cultures don't have a specific word for it. And I don't actually like the, the expression uh, moral positioning system. Because, you know, the Earth kind of stays the, where it is, and the features of the planet stay where they are, more or less. But that's not true of our social norms. They change. Um, and that's one of the, the powerful things, actually, about, uh, about our social norms, is that they are not r tight, rule-bound, strict things. They are kind of centers of gravity, if you like, or, or prototypes of what we think appropriate behavior is, but they can change over time. OK. <clears throat> uh, morality, according to Hume, is based on utility or aesthetics. Morality, according to Kant, um, comes from the categorical imperative. Where in your evolutionary narrative is the evolution of A, aesthetics, B, utility, C, categorical imperative? Yeah, well, I'm not quite sure how to answer that. I mean, first of all, that isn't true of Hume. He didn't think that our morality was an aesthetic thing. Right. Who, who was the question he, from, by the way? That was me. Oh. He writes about moral action. Yeah. 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 He talks about the moral sentiment. That's the fundamental story for Hume, is the moral sentiment and the importance of reasoning in solving social problems. Um, that's the hume of the treatise. Um, but uh, so where did Hume get it, come to his ideas? I mean, that, that's sort of a question for a cultural historian. And I, I well, don't really No, my, my question well, more is more biologically. <laughs> when do you think these things occurred, that there was a sense of either the categorical imperative, if you're Kantian, or uh, moral action coming, f uh, being defined in terms of utilitarianism or in terms of aesthetics. I, 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 I'd like well, to know I think that. It's, I don't think it's very new. I think the, the categorical imperative basically just says, okay. you don't get to make an exception of your own case. That, that you don't get to say, everybody has to follow the law except for me, because I'm me. So, I mean, that's, that's a, a simplified gloss on it, and the simplification is necessary because otherwise Kant is ununderstandable. Um, but, you know, everybody has known since ever. I mean, you'll see this in Aristotle. You'll see it in Marcus Aurelius. Everybody knows that the consequences are important. So, when uh, the utilitarians frame the utilitarian principle, which says something is right to the extent that you maximize aggregate happiness, that wasn't just saying the consequences are important. It was saying that the only correct way to make your moral decisions is to adhere to that. And if it conflicts with values, tough biscuits. And that, of course, has been the soft underbelly of utilitarianism, is that sometimes you can calculate the utilities. Here would, here would be an example. So why wouldn't we do this? Raise babies, let's just say a room of 20 at a time, and then by the time they're a year old, harvest their organs for people who need them. So if you have 20 babies and you manage to save 200 humans, the utilitarian math is straightforward. We're done. And yet I think most of us would be truly horrified because it's a case where a value, something that we hold really deeply because it involves children, is trashed. It's of no consequence. And you can, any undergraduate will come up with lots and lots of examples like that. So that's been the problem with utilitarianism. And that doesn't mean that the consequences don't matter. It's just that 
they're not the only thing that matters. And, um, and you know, because Reed works on decision making in brains, and, and maybe th this is kind of in concordance with how you think of it, but if you think that decision making in general is a constraint satisfaction process, whether it's about building a house or moving to another city or taking a new job or whatever. It's a constraint satisfaction process, meaning there isn't just one rule that you b abide by, like do the cheapest roof possible on your house. There are other things that come into play. Would it look nice? Would it last long? And so forth. So many constraints feed into it, and that's also true of moral decisions. Yeah. We do take the consequences into account, but it's not the only thing. We care about our values. We care about whether it clashes with other norms, about what people will think of us, about whether we can live with our decision, and so forth. So Reid, you, you, this, this might work for you because you, you do a great deal in this area. The simple picture of the reward system's effect on learned behavior works on the clean dichotomy of good versus bad. But in the complex world of unknown rewards and long-term returns, how does this system function? Um, well, I just told the story of um, uh, the way the dopamine system was first sort of uh, um, dug out. Um, serotonin, for example, that you all will have heard of because you've heard of SSRIs, um, is known to be involved in learning to wait, uh, learning to persist in the face of wanting to quit, um, being aversive to things, it's, it's, it's a little more um, confusing than dopamine. The dopamine system itself in, in new experiments in rodents has been shown to have specialized cells, cells that spe projections that specialize in consumatory behavior, cells that seem to specialize in social behavior that seems to be different, those seem to be separated from one another. Um, and then all of that is um, poured into a pot with the degree to which you should be willing to work hard for something, right? And that depends on all kinds of things. For example, how hungry you are, okay? So if you're, if you're a squirrel wandering around in a field um, of grass and there are nuts hidden there, then that's a very low bar to the effort it takes to go find the nuts. Suppose instead the field is filled with uh, stickers that sticks the squirrel every time it walks and the nuts are now in the same exact position. So the only difference between field one and field two is every time you take a step in field two, you're, you're getting stuck. Well, you'll forage on field two if you're hungry enough. And so it completely changes your value function given the problem at hand. And so that kind of flexibility and what ends up being rewarding to you and whatnot, um, that, that's probably the basis of things like the Stockholm Syndrome. Somebody comes and breaks your arm every Tuesday you get into a perturbed state where all of a sudden you're thanking somebody for not breaking your arm this Tuesday. And so these are, these are flex we have not until very recently had an ability to study these systems at the same time. That is, we've not until literally the last five years had an ability to make fast recordings in brains of the release and fluctuation of dopamine and serotonin and norepinephrine and all these neuromodulators. And so that's coming. Okay, well, <clears throat> here's, here's two together. Um, if addiction is learned behavior, what strategies does that yield for overcoming it? Part one. Part two. How can psychedelics imp impact moral reasoning? <laughs> okay. We'll start with the electric Kool Aid acid test at the end, or with psychedelic. Now, I, let's, let me start with uh, if addiction is um, learned behavior. Addiction is a learned behavior. I mean, it's completely learned behavior. If you don't, if 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 I were giving you the drug and your nervous system did not have something to which to assign the learning, then you wouldn't be able to, uh, you, wouldn't be, you're, you wouldn't be addicted. You wouldn't have a cue that would set you off. Uh, there is um, there's a lot of work in this domain in an area called behavioral economics where people um, pit your drug of choice against various kinds of systems of peeing clean into a cup and voucher systems. So you're paid, that's one rewarding stimulus, to not take your drug. You're paid for clean urine. And people have gotten pretty good results with that. However, no matter what you say, no matter what therapy you point to, I, I work with a guy at um, Virginia Tech named Warren Bickle, who's, who who's, um, kind of wrote the book on this part. 
Uh, it's a chronic relapsing condition. It's just a chronic relapsing condition. 95 to 98% of all people will try addictive drugs at some point in their life, and often to an excess. And only a small percent of people become chronically relapsing drug addicts. And we do not understand that difference very well at all. And so the strategies that we have now are learning strategies. Um, there's um, buprenorphine and things that block the impact at the receptor level, um, but those don't provide any kind of long-term, um, they, they protect you, like if you overdose on heroin and we block your uh, opiate receptors and you won't die right then, okay? It won't do anything for you long-term. The psychedelics, um, how can psychedelics impact moral reasoning? Um, I don't think I'm, I don't have a comment on that, I mean. <laughs> what is there to say? Of course, they <laughs> impact moral reasoning. You know, uh, people do crazy things. On if you're talking, what are we talking about? Ergotamine and LSD and um, whose question is this, by the way? Would you, mind, would you mind just saying this again? Because I couldn't, I couldn't hear it. I'm sure the rest of them could. So I was just wondering because I heard that they can make you lose your sense of self and, and that would make you want the best for more people other than yourself. So would that... Uh, so more like psilocybin or LSD? Right, it has all kinds of effects. It has all kinds of sensory effects too, and so it's hard to it's hard to pin down what's causing you to have your self borders bleed away. But schizophrenia one of the one of the main symptoms of schizophrenia is blurred self boundaries. Um, we have a question. What's that? Follow up. But I mean that we. Uh, I have a follow up. Yeah, you have a follow up. I don't think we understand that at all, really. Uh, you know. So uh, actually, maybe a, a, a different drug that might have direct uh, impact would be ecstasy, right, which raises uh, serotonin levels yeah. and causes affiliative behaviors that uh, enhances affiliative behaviors. They right? love everyone. Right. right. They also lose temperature control. <laughs> it's classic that ecstasy causes loss of temperature control and you can, you can go into a crisis because your, you, your internal temperature gets high. So... Um, another question here. This sounds like it's from Leo. It's probably effective altruism. Or, given that our organizations and world-dominating companies don't have a deeply ingrained ability to distinguish between right and wrong, how do we calibrate these entities in favor of moral progress? <laughs> That's a great question, though. And then you can run the United Nations. <laughs> Yeah, companies, companies become like uh, organisms without consciences, and not because there are people in there that are necessarily immoral. It's an interesting feature. These systems build up and it dehumanizes you. Just an insurance company is yeah. like that. An insurance company dehumanizes you in that Where way. Where did that question come from? Yeah. Do you want to uh, elaborate on it for one, one sentence? Well, I mean, I can't give an answer, which is why I asked the question. But um, yeah, largely as to the fact that we see certain companies operating similar to how a psychopath might operate, yeah. just because they don't have this internal system where they can kind of differentiate between what their core values are and how they're acting, and to see that gap. Um, yeah, just wondering if you have any thoughts on. I, I think it's methods. a collective phenomenon. I think that a big part of that is a collective phenomena, not necessarily. I mean. Okay, you have a company and there's some evil local, you know, Larry Ellison's running it and um, he's a very competitive person because we all have seen this in public. And what about countries? Same thing. Same thing. There are all these agencies that form these collective things that are probably thinking in some primitive way we don't understand and they're not equipped with consciences. Yeah, but so it would behoove us to understand what... But this is this is where the, this is where the, the, the problem is. Uh, Siddharth, why don't you read this question of yours? Um, so this question is inspired by uh, thinking about uh, like morality uh, in different contexts about time. 
So I wanted to ask, like, uh, take the example of Buddha or Jesus, Gandhi, Jefferson, uh, or many such symbols of moral virtues. Uh, they lived in different times than ours. Our moral principles of issues such as LGBT values would have been foreign and repugnant to them. Uh, they were products of their own times. Um, we like try to uh, respect them, we try to glorify them, but then does morality depends on social conditions uh, or like time because uh, they could not understand our moral values uh, about LGBT or about race? I, I take your point on that, but I think e even so, with someone like Aristotle or the Buddha talks about particular moral virtues of, say, humility or courage or kindness or mercifulness or moderation, those all kind of strike a chord. Um, but particular moral questions or issues can, of course, be different for different cultures. And Would you mind telling about the time you met the Dalai Lama? I like that story. Oh. Because you had, you had the questions about Buddhism and so on oh, and so yeah. forth. Yeah. Um, I sort of was off my, uh, off my oh. train of thought. Um, I don't quite know what to say at this okay, point. Okay, well, yeah. Um, yeah. It was just seemed on point with what you were talking about with that. I mean, what, what I, I guess I find really interesting about your question, and it's something I, don't, I really don't understand, is the ways in which norms change. Now, there is an experiment from Reed Montague's lab that gives me an indication of how they change. And the experiment basically shows that if your expectations about reward, that can be approval, for example, if your expectations are geared to a certain level and then change, then we can see a norm change. And I think that happened in my lifetime with regard to something like homosexuality, which um, I think at the time that I was a very young child would have been considered, you know, really dreadful and awful and, you know, nobody should do that. Um, and over time, of course, it changed. And there were many factors that played into that, many social factors. And I'm not a sociologist, so there's other people who couldn't speak to that better than I. But, but the sea change with regard to acceptance of that has been absolutely enormous. And, and so one of the things that would be interesting to understand is more about uh, how it is that norms can change. I mean, there is a sort of philosophical idea that you just have to give somebody a really good argument and their norms will change. And we all know that's psychologically completely false. Uh, that's not how it happens. <laughs> um, this, you're this stalking is, me. No, I'm not. Oh, okay. I mean, if, uh, <laughs> he's running for office. I have no twinge of conscience at that moment. Re this was on your point that you just made. Recent studies have connected genes associated with homosexuality with greater sexual success in straight people. How does the evolution of sexuality fit in your view of empathy and the reward system? I don't, re well, I don't know. I don't know hmm. how it does. Uh, it's an interesting question. Yeah. Um, I don't think that we know enough at this point to have an answer, but I could well be wrong. Wouldn't be the first time. Right. I'd, I'd like to comment on this other question. Yeah, I, all you are is a bright light, guys, so I don't yeah, know if I'm looking in the right place. It, yeah, your voice is from the yeah, I can dark. See him now, but the, the worst the test ever. You know? <laughs> um, but this idea of starting to understand the rudiments of what forms a basic conscience out of parts that themselves don't have consciences um, as a collective phenomenon, I think that um, uh, in the small, is, an is at least a starting explanation for why is it that companies don't have consciences. Even though they may have very moral people working in it, may be composed of a lot of parts, mm -hmm. all those parts tend to interact. And in the composite, you know, they end up deforesting the Amazon or they, um, or they let somebody die because they don't serve their insurance policy or whatever. 
Um, that's something that we can understand, start to understand. That's the kind of collective phenomena across scales. We have heterogeneous agents interacting with one another. You can ask the question, what would it mean for it to either develop a conscience or for you to install one of some right. sort? So, follow up here. Does conscience require action? For example, about babies showing empathy. There is still a gap between feeling... Um, Feeling emotion, shame, empathy, and acting on those emotions. Can someone have a conscience even if they do not behave in a moral way? Sure. People can feel. Can be. There are lots of reasons that you don't act. You could be afraid to act. It could be too threatening for you, but yet you want, you know, you might not be strong enough to act. You might be um, trapped in some physical way. Yeah. And we do have an extraordinary capacity for kind of hiving off certain aspects of our life that uh, might otherwise cause our conscience to squeal. Um, and, uh, and I don't think that's only true of the people who work for tobacco companies, for example, or the priests in Boston and Los Angeles. I think that it's probably true that many of us, under certain circumstances, will just kind of find a way of damping down the uneasiness that, uh, that our conscience I mean, that's just part of the complexity of the whole, the whole thing. Um, and I, I ha no, that's that's okay. Yeah. Your conscience got the better on you. No, yeah, I just said I'm, I'm, yeah. <laughs> it's just I'm very unsure <laughs> of what I'm about to say. Um, it's just very <laughs> conjectural. So. But one of the things clearly that, that makes our, our lives very complex as humans is the fact that norms can compete with other norms and preferences can compete with preferences. And uh, values can compete with values. And so sometimes we direct our attention to this value as opposed to that value and, 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 and away we go. And we're often put in circumstances where there is no right answer. And you have to kind of get used to the horribleness of that and the fact that, that you have to live with great uncertainty. Or I mean, inconsistency. Think, You're saying inconsistency even. Yes, absolutely. And, and social life is very hard. And living with, well, life is very hard, I guess. But living with inconsistency is something that we have accommodated. Um, and, and, you know, the ancients, the, you know, Aristotle and, 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 and Plato and certainly Socrates understood this very well. Even in simple decision making, yeah, we have inconsistent the preferences. Could he, uh, let me just give you this for a second. If I may offer some real-world insight about yes. these corporations having worked for one, um, what I find is that people shift their values to the group. Um, I, yeah. I actually worked for a PR firm that, you know, tried, that successfully told people that smoking is your American right. It's an act of freedom. Um, and why would people do this knowing that smoking will kill you? Um, because they had shifted their value to you had to do right by the client. The client was paying you, therefore you must do your best by the client. So I think, unfortunately, this is how these things come about. People are still moral, but they've changed what the goal of their morality is. That's harder to, uh, I wanted to get an analogous story for the priests in Boston, and it's hard. Uh, I think, I don't know how to make that story work in that case. Um, I mean, somehow they lived with an inconsistency um, because in some cases they were very decent humans in the course of ordinary business. Uh, it's just that when it came to little boys in the choir, they weren't. Um, so I don't know. I mean, that's 
right? The, the, uh, There's one thing that in, 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 learn, in the learning world, in the neurobiological learning world, um, there's this idea of creep. And I don't mean creepy people. I mean incremental right. changes. Yeah. And so um, uh, lots of organisms can be driven into certain behavioral uh, para states slowly, right? Heat the frog up slowly and it doesn't jump out of the pot, right? right. And so, so my version of that, I, and I'm not I an, say, believe no. me, I'm, I'm not an apologist for that, is that you don't come to it in a big jump because you would, yeah. because you do have these warning systems. Right. You creep over to it slowly, you adjust to yeah. the new level, and then yeah. you creep again, and then you weigh reporting on somebody against, uh, yeah. and it just, it, it's an interesting object lesson of how very, far yeah. off yeah. it can get. Um, here, let me try and put these three together and you'll see why. What difference does it make that we now have a neuroscience glimmer of an explanation for something that's really wired into us by birth? Second one. So are we saying studies that highlight personality behavioral difference in siblings based on birth order are wrong and is sociopathy primarily inherited defect? And is socio psycho psychopathy being a serial killer genetic? And if so, why don't previous generations act similarly? Um, there may be people in the audience who are better equipped than I to answer the question about birth order, but my understanding is that the data showing that there are these big behavioral and personality differences based on birth order is highly questionable, that there were, it was very underpowered, not enough subjects. Uh, subjects were selected from history that because they fit the hypothesis. I don't know. What do you know? You're talking about Soloway's work. Yeah. Yeah, I think it. Frank Soloway? Yeah, yeah, I don't yeah. think it went away. I think it just got um, yeah. multiplied by a half. How do you, uh, this, this is something we haven't touched on, I suppose we ought to. How do you comment on organized religion as a moral guideline? Um, I can't quite read the next bit. And who, who wrote this one? Did you? Okay, can you can you read it for me? Because I got lost in the bracket there. Um, how do you comment on organized religion as a moral guideline, uh, i.e., uh, right is you go to heaven, or behaving incorrectly is you go to hell, and uh, how even within the same religion do some followers behave in a good or moral way and some don't? Thank you. Hmm. Yeah, well... Maybe now is the time to talk about the Dalai Lama story. <laughs> okay, so there were a group of us who went to Los Angeles to talk to the Dalai Lama because he wanted to learn about the brain. This was about 30 years ago, and it was organized by this amazing neuroscientist who had started the neuroscience department here, Bob Livingston. Right. And so... Um, Larry Squire, who works on memory, and Antonio Damasio, and I, and Alan Hobson, who works on sleep and dreaming, off we went. And um, so we each had our little bit to do, and my bit was to talk about whether or not it's plausible to assume that there is something that survives the bodily death that goes into some child, and then that child becomes the next Dalai Lama. So, you know. so anyway, then we had lunch. And uh, it was lovely sitting outside in this nice table. And, and there was a retinue of monks that had come with the Dalai Lama. And, and uh, I was seated between two of them. And you know, I'm sort of a well brought up girl. I uh, know that I'm expected to make conversation. And so I said, so carefully, I mean, this is so embarrassing to even have to tell a story. So tell me, what in Buddhism corresponds to the Ten Commandments? Silence. And then very graciously, without you know, making me feel like the, the fool that I was, they went on to explain how there aren't rules in Buddhism. There aren't rules like the Ten Commandments, that there are models of good behavior. There are virtues, like the virtue of being humble, or being courageous, or being kind. But I said, OK, so you, know, you must have a rule like you, know, you can't have an abortion like you know, some folks hear about. And, uh, and they said, no, we don't. 
vote. Um, but if someone thinks about that's what they may wish to do, then we talk about it and they talk to their family and they talk to their friends, but there is no rule. And so I was actually quite dumbstruck by, by this idea, though I shouldn't have been, because that's really the thrust of Aristotle as well. It's not, morality is not about rules. It's about cultivating habits so that you can respond appropriately in the multiferous kinds of conditions in which you're going to find yourself. So anyway, on the way home, I thought, you know, if rules are really that important as contrasted to virtues and models the way the Buddhists do it, then there should be a difference in the quality of the people who make up the population. So Christians should really be better folks, morally speaking, than the Buddhists. And do we find that? It didn't look like it. I mean, you know, there's bad people in both, in both sides. So it doesn't look like, although sometimes we tell ourselves, you have to have rules in order to do the right thing. You're really not following rules. You say you're following rules, but what you're mostly doing is responding to what you've learned, the people you've modeled yourself after, the kinds of examples that you've encountered in your experience, how you deal with your empathy, how you deal with the mass of other feelings that, that play in there. So it taught me a lot about the fact that um, rules probably are kind of abstractions from moral behavior in general, but they're not what you have to do in order to, to behave morally. And the, and the kicker here really has to do with kids. I mean, every kid knows by the time they're four years old that don't lie is a rule you break fairly often. Not for your own you know, uh, advantage, but because it would be rude to tell the truth. Your grandmother says, D you know, does my hat look nice on me? And you don't say, no, it looks silly. Even a four-year-old knows that. They know that the rules that they're taught in Sunday school have to be regularly broken when the conditions demand it. And that is subtle. But we don't do ourselves any favor by saying, well, you know, what we really need to do is just adhere more strictly <laughs> to the Ten Commandments. Yeah, I, I asked, I asked that. Dalai Lama after neuroscience, uh, I think it was an SFN meeting, I said, um, I think I told you the story, Your Holiness. Um, if there was quite clear neuroscientific evidence that one, a, a tenet of Buddhism was wrong, I mean, what would you do? Yeah. And he said, if it's wrong, we change it. Oh, yeah, and he did actually on the spot because um, he wanted to understand about dreaming. And, um, and Alan Hobson went, you know, talked about dreaming in the the sleep cycles and when you dream and blah, blah, blah. And he said, well, is it true that you only dream on your right side? He said, because we Buddhists believe that. And Alan Hobson said, absolutely not. OK, then he said, not. <laughs> um, it's 7.30. Um, yeah. Um, and so we should probably, uh, I've got some questions left here, but I think um, um, perhaps we can just give Pat and Reed, a round of applause for these wonderful answers to that. Well, thank you. And uh, thank you all for coming, and uh, we'll let you know when the next one is. <laughs>